This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Renee, and welcome to Season 1 of Beyond Contempt, a podcast where the surreal meets the real. You're listening to Episode 1, Amy Bishop. On Friday, February 12, 2010, several faculty members were holding a biology department meeting in 369R. This room was located on the third floor of the Shelby Center for Science and Technology at the University of Alabama Huntsville campus. The university was home to 7,200 students, ready to start their weekend. Dr. Gopi Padilla, the department chair, passed out an itinerary to the meeting attendees and sat at the head of the table. Stephanie Monticello, the staff assistant, sat to the right of Dr. Padilla, and Dr. Adriel Johnson was to his left. Dr. Amy Bishop walked in the door, and everyone rearranged chairs to make room for her at the table. She took a seat between Gopi and Adriel. Dr. Deborah Moriarty sat across the table from Amy. Dr. Bishop was vocal at these meetings, but on this particular day, she was subdued. The year prior, in March 2009, Amy was denied tenure, which meant that her employment at the college was over at the end of the current semester. Amy appealed her tenure denial, but that too was rejected in November 2009. The agenda for today's meeting was to talk about the upcoming semester, a semester that would not include Dr. Amy Bishop. Demmer noticed Amy's demeanor at the meeting and decided that she would talk with her later to see how she was doing, and to see how her job search had been going. Fifty minutes into the meeting, right before 4 p.m., a 44-year-old Amy Bishop pulled a 9mm Ruger out of her handbag. She held the pistol steady with both hands, stood up, pointed the gun at Gopi, and pulled the trigger. Amy started with those that were sitting closest to her and continued down the line of the table, shooting people execution-style. She was methodical and without emotion. Next, she shot at Stephanie, then Adriel. On his left sat Dr. Maria Raglan Davis. Amy shot her too. Some faculty dropped to the floor and scrambled out of the line of fire. A bullet had ricocheted and wounded Dr. Luis Cruz Vera in the chest. As Dr. Joseph Leahy tried to duck down, Amy pulled the trigger again. Deborah hit the floor, crawled under the table, and grabbed Amy's leg, hoping to knock her down. Bishop pointed the gun at Deborah, and Deborah pled for her life, asking Amy to think about her daughter and grandson. Deborah crawled out of the room, and Amy followed right behind her. She pulled the trigger. The gun clicked several times, but bullets did not discharge from the weapon. In that instant, Deborah crawled back into the room. Dr. Robert Lawton slammed the door shut and locked Amy out. Other faculty barricaded the door and covered the window so that Amy could not see in. Deborah called 911 while others tried to help the wounded by applying shirts, napkins, or anything else they could find to stop the bleeding. Dr. Deborah Moriarty and five others remained unharmed. The whole incident lasted 20 to 30 seconds from start to finish. Amy did not speak one word during the incident. She walked downstairs to a second floor bathroom where she rinsed off the gun and dropped it into the wastebasket along with her blood spattered jacket. She piled papers and trash to obscure the evidence. Amy walked to another room where she borrowed a student's cell phone and called her husband, James Anderson. She told him that she was done for the day and she was ready to be picked up. It was their date night and they planned to go out for coffee. Meanwhile, ambulances arrived on the scene after 4 p.m. Amy was a solid woman with a 5 foot 10 inch, 150 pound frame. From a distance, she looked more like a soccer mom who was running an errand in her red v-neck sweater and jeans instead of an unhinged killer. A sheriff's deputy found her on the loading dock of the Shelby Center and cuffed her. Even though police had the shooter in custody, The panic continued. Several individuals, 
who may have been responding to threats Amy had made in the past, had warned the police that Dr. Bishop may have placed herpes bombs around the science building. She had performed herpes research in the past and also had written an unpublished novel where the herpes virus was released into the world. After investigating, the police determined that no such herpes bombs existed. They put a dazed Amy Bishop in the back of a squad car while a reporter was on the scene, asking her what happened. Amy responded, It didn't happen. There's no way. There's no way. They are all still alive. When Amy arrived at Metro Jail, they took her to an interview room. She was confused and had no recollection of the shooting. There is no way, she repeated. It was just a bad dream, and she would wake up. Either that or she was hallucinating. She said she needed to go. She had meetings to attend. A police officer showed her pictures of the victims and told her that this is real. These handcuffs are real. And you are going to a jail cell. This is real. At 10.15 p.m., James Anderson, Amy's husband, was told everything that had taken place, and he was in disbelief. Police then questioned him to ensure that he had not played a part in the planning of the shootings. That evening, they released the names of the confirmed victims to their families. Dr. Scopi Padilla, Adriel Johnson, and Maria Raglan Davis were dead. Dr. Joseph Leahy was critically injured, and Stephanie Monticello had suffered serious head wounds. Dr. Louise Cruz Vera was injured, but was expected to live. Dr. Gopi Padilla was the head of the biology department at the University of Alabama Huntsville. He earned his PhD from Indiana State University, where he taught molecular biology systems, advanced molecular techniques, plant molecular biology, and biotechnology. Gopi was married with two daughters and had authored three books. Graduate students loved him. One student had stated that Dr. Padilla was the reason he wanted to come study at UAH. 1,000 people attended his funeral. Dr. Adriel Johnson was an associate professor of biology and taught several science classes. He earned his PhD in animal science and nutritional physiology from North Carolina State University. Adriel also served as an advisor for the Minority Graduate Student Association and was the campus director for a minority participation program. He mentored African American graduate students in math, science, and engineering. He volunteered his time with the Boy Scouts and was himself an Eagle Scout. Both of his sons spoke at his funeral, stating that they would be better husbands, fathers, and community leaders because of their dad. Dr. Maria Raglan Davis was an associate professor of biology. Her PhD was in biochemistry from North Carolina State. Her specialty was molecular biology and plant genetics. Maria was married with three kids. At her funeral, People spoke about how optimistic she was. She was goal-oriented, loved to cook, and adored animals. Maria even survived breast cancer while attaining her PhD. The autopsy report had shown all three professors' deaths were a result of homicide. Dr. Joseph Leahy was married with two sons and had earned his PhD from the University of Maryland. His research was in molecular genetics. The bullet had entered his head, severed his optic nerve, robbed him of sight in one eye, shattered his jaw, and lodged in proximity to the jugular vein. Stephanie Monticello was married with two children. She was also a grandmother and a native of Queens, New York. Stephanie had worked at the University of Alabama Huntsville since 2001. When the shooting began, she had turned her head and covered her face with her hands. The bullet shattered her ring finger, then entered the temporal lobe of her brain. As the bullet continued, it destroyed her sinuses, broke her jaw, blew teeth out of her mouth, left her blind in one eye, and shot tooth fragments into her airway. Dr. Louise Cruz Vera was a professor of biological sciences and received his PhD from Stanford University in genetics and molecular biology. 
Even though he took a bullet to the chest, he planned to return to work as soon as possible. The morning after the shooting, the Huntsville police received a call from Paul Frazier, who was the chief of police from Braintree, Massachusetts, the place where Amy had grown up. The purpose of the call was to provide information to Alabama authorities about Amy Bishop. He wanted the Alabama police to know that Amy had shot and killed her brother in 1986. Paul wanted to make sure that Dr. Bishop did not get away with another shooting. Amy had grown up in Braintree, Massachusetts, which was a middle-class suburb located south of Boston and had a population of 33,000. Amy lived there with her brother Seth, her mother Judy, and her father Sam. She was a lover of both music and science and played the violin in third grade. Amy was smart and somewhat shy as a child. Some of her classmates characterized her as being odd. She graduated high school in 1983 with a class of 600 students. In 1985, the Bishop family had been at the wake of Sam's father, Amy's grandfather. When they returned home, they found that their house had been burglarized. In response to the robbery, Sam had purchased a 12-gauge shotgun. He stored the unloaded gun in his bedroom closet, and a box of 25 rounds rested on a dresser. In the fall of 1986, Amy and Seth were both enrolled at Northeastern University in Boston, where their father Sam had taught art. Seth studied electrical engineering and played the violin in the Boston Youth Symphony. On December 6, 1986, Sam left the house to go to the store. Later on that day, Judy Bishop placed a frantic call to 911, stating that her daughter had shot her son. She had witnessed the entire event, and she needed help immediately. Officers were on the scene in ten minutes, and met Judy at the front door of her home. Seth Bishop was laying on the kitchen floor, bleeding out, and 21-year-old Amy Bishop was nowhere to be found. Seth was still breathing, so CPR was initiated. He was taken to the hospital by ambulance. Judy rolled with one officer to the hospital, and officers were sent to search for Amy. Sam had returned home from the store to find emergency lights at his house. Sam then rushed to the hospital in time for medical staff to pronounce his 18-year-old son dead at 3.08 p.m. Right after shooting Seth, Amy had fled the scene with the gun. She stepped into the street and tried to hijack a car. Amy pointed the gun at the first person she saw driving down the street, but the driver stepped on the gas to escape the situation. When that driver returned home, she called the police. Amy walked down the street and arrived at the auto body shop, where she walked around the lot looking for cars to steal. Amy pointed her gun at two employees, told them to put their hands up, and said, I need a car. I just got in a fight with my husband. He's looking for me, and he's going to kill me. Amy kept repeating this fictional story over and over. The men turned and ran. Amy continued on and walked around the car lot. She found another employee at the dealership and demanded a car. As he responded that he didn't have a car for her, the police had arrived on the scene. Officer Ronald Solomini had approached Amy and tried to reason with her. He had his gun drawn, but hidden at his side. He ordered her to drop her weapon. Amy refused and kept the shotgun pointed at the officer. Another officer, Tim Murphy approached Amy from behind with his pistol drawn and pointed at her head. He shouted at her to drop the weapon multiple times. After about a minute and a half, the whole incident ended with Officer Murphy walking up behind Amy and grabbing the barrel of the shotgun. When she let go of the weapon, officers handcuffed her. On the ride to the police station, Amy mentioned that she had argued with her father earlier in the day. This led law enforcement to initially believe that it played a role in the shooting. At the jail, when she was interrogated about loading the shotgun in the first place, Amy stated that she worried about robbers coming into the house. She had taken the shotgun and shells to her bedroom, where she had loaded them into the gun, and accidentally fired it into the vanity mirror. 
She tried to cover the hole in her wall so her mother wouldn't find it. Amy went downstairs to ask her mother if she knew how to unload the shotgun. Amy added that she did not kill her brother on purpose. At this point in the interview, Judy Bishop burst into the booking room at the jailhouse and told Amy not to answer any more questions. Judy said, I've just lost one child and I'm not going to lose another. The chief of the Braintree Police Department, John Polio, had ordered a stop to the interview for the time being. Due to Amy's emotional state, he released her into her parents' custody. As the interview was being conducted, the bishop's neighbors had been cleaning up the bloody mess in the kitchen before Sam and Judy returned home. Later that night, an autopsy was performed. The medical examiner ruled the death an accident pending a police investigation. Seth's funeral was held at a Unitarian church in Braintree. Someone reported that Amy appeared catatonic throughout the service. Many people spoke at the funeral. Neighbors, teachers, Sam and Judy all shared warm stories, remembering the promising young man that Seth was. Amy, too, had shared a story about how Seth saved her life when she was five years old. Given the circumstances of his death, it was reported that Amy's words seemed ill-considered and perhaps misplaced. On the 17th of December, 11 days after Seth's death, officers went to the Bishop residence to continue their interview of Amy and her parents. Sam Bishop gave his recount of the day of the incident and stated that he thought Amy had loaded the gun because she was frightened by the robbery that had taken place at their home. After Judy Bishop finished her interview, Amy gave her statement to the police she went downstairs to have Seth help her unload the gun because she was fearful of the weapon. The gun discharged. She ran from the room thinking she had ruined the kitchen. And the next thing she remembered, she was seeing her mother at the police station. A final report was written by Trooper Brian Howe. The shooting was ruled an accident, and there would be no further investigation. This did not sit well with some of the officers on the Braintree Police Department. Amy did not see a therapist after the shooting. She returned back to college and moved on with life. Amy really spoke of her brother Seth. She graduated with honors from the Northeastern University of Boston and enrolled in a Ph.D. program at Harvard in 1988. In 1989, Amy married Jim Anderson, who had also been a student at Northeastern University. The couple met through a campus Dungeons & Dragons group. At one point, Amy had broken up with him but James had waited for her to return to him, which she did. Jim's father, Jimmy Sr., found his daughter-in-law off-putting because she had insisted that her new husband go by the name of James instead of Jimmy Jr. Amy told him that Jimmy made him sound low-class when combined with a southern accent. Amy had kept her maiden name instead of taking her husband's last name. She had only used his last name for the instances when she got into legal trouble. Jimmy Anderson Sr. had said, James deserved some kind of medal for living with her. She was at the extreme end of bossy. At one point, Jimmy Sr. had even said that he had seen the devil in her eyes. When she had first met James Anderson's mother, Amy had stiffened and backed up when his mom went in to hug her. Being a Southerner, the mother felt both rejected and insulted. In 1991, Amy had their first daughter, Lily. Not long after, Amy had two more daughters, Thea and Phaedra. Her last child was born in 2001, and they had named him Seth, after Amy's brother. In 1993, Amy was awarded her Ph.D. and began the first of many postdoctoral jobs. One source stated that the quality of Amy's work was poor and not worthy of being granted a Ph.D., Amy started a job in a lab run by neurologist Dr. Paul Rosenberg at the Children's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Rosenberg felt that Amy could not meet the standard required for work in the lab, and he would not give her a good review. Dr. Rosenberg thought Amy was unstable and exhibited violent behavior. Amy was forced to resign that same year. One month after her resignation, Dr. Paul Rosenberg had returned home after vacation to find a suspicious package left at his front door. When the doctor cautiously opened the package, 
It turned out to be a pair of six-inch pipes connected to nine-volt batteries. They called the bomb squad to the house. One bomb was discharged inside a detonating cannon. The bomb squad disconnected the second bomb and sent it to the lab for testing. The ATF conducted the investigation. What had surfaced in some interviews was that James Anderson had spoken to friends and had inquired several times about how to construct a pipe bomb. James Anderson was upset with his wife's situation, and in one conversation it uttered the words, shoot him, bomb him, stab him, or strangle him. In another conversation, James had stated that he wanted to get back at Dr. Rosenberg. As a joke, Amy had given one of her colleagues 10 pounds of a potassium compound, which was a known explosive. They had searched the Bishop Anderson home, but no evidence was found. The ATF considered Amy and James persons of interest. They were kept under surveillance, but charges were never filed. In 1996, Amy was working as a researcher at Beth Israel Hospital in the cardiology department in Boston. She authored a paper with several other researchers. The paper was published, and Dr. Jessica Grossman was listed first, since she had put in more of the work on the project. When Amy found out that she had been listed second, she became enraged. Another author on the paper had said, she exploded into something emotional that we had never seen before in our careers. This was just one incident that factored into the teaching hospital deciding not to renew her contract. One day in 2002, Amy and her family went for breakfast at an IHOP in Peabody, Massachusetts. Amy asked for a booster seat for Seth but the last one was just taken. She started a scene in the restaurant and declared that her family had arrived there first. Amy approached the woman who had taken the last booster seat and had been sitting down to breakfast with her own children. Amy launched into explicative laced rant. She repeated over and over, I am Dr. Amy Bishop, as everyone in the restaurant looked on in shock and amazement. The IHOP manager intervened and asked Amy to leave the restaurant. Before she left, Amy went back to the woman and punched her in the side of the head. Law enforcement eventually found and arrested Amy. She was ordered by the court to attend anger management classes. Amy filed a counter-complaint with the police against the woman she had punched. Amy's statement said the other woman had started the incident, had used the explicit language, had blocked the door when the bishops tried to leave, and had even tried to claw her face. They dropped the charges against Amy. She never attended any anger management classes, and the incident never appeared on her record. Amy enjoyed writing and wanted to be a fiction author. She had been part of a writing group while living in Massachusetts. Amy often wrote about characters and incidents that mirrored her own life's experiences, from writing about female scientists with violent tendencies to the female protagonist mistakenly killing her brother to husbands who were unmotivated men from Alabama. It did not take long for Amy to alienate the writers from their author's group. She had worked on a fiction project called Amazon Fever, which was a thriller and was a collaboration between herself, her husband James, and another local writer, Lenny Cavallaro. Amy had insisted that Lenny find a publisher who would pre-fund this project. When Lenny tried to explain to Amy how book publishing works, how unpublished authors would never receive an advance on an unsolicited script, Amy became indignant. She told Lenny that she would deny he was ever an author on the project. Lenny walked away from the project and the friendship. Later, he would say that Amy was a terrible writer. The Bishops were not a popular family in their Ipswich, Massachusetts community. Amy yelled at neighborhood children who were too loud. She attempted to get one of her children's teachers fired. She tried to get the ice cream truck banned from her street because her daughter was lactose intolerant. And her household was the only one to not be invited to the 100-person neighborhood block party. She called the police many times over the four short years that they lived there. Most of the complaints were about the children playing in the neighborhood. A boy had ridden his bike past the Bishop House, and James Anderson had knocked the kid off his bike. The boy's mother called the police, but James denied the incident ever happened. In 2003, 
Amy applied for a job at the University of Alabama Huntsville teaching biology. On the application, it asked if she had ever been convicted of something more than a minor traffic violation. She answered no, since she had never been convicted of anything, despite all her prior violent incidents. The resume she submitted to the university showed that she was employed at Harvard two years longer than she actually was there. Amy was offered and accepted the tenure-track position in Huntsville. As the Bishop family packed up and headed to Alabama, many of the neighbors made comments like, Ding dong, the witch is dead, and God help the people of Alabama. They ordered pizza. Someone brought beer. It was a party to celebrate. Good riddance, Amy. In Alabama, Bishop seemed happy in her new role, and even received a few positive reviews from students on RateMyTeachers.com. The graduate students who worked in her lab were less positive about working with her. Several graduate students transferred to different labs after witnessing Amy's outbursts and temper tantrums. Amy fired one of her graduate students. The student had agreed to return her lab keys the next day. Vindictively, Amy called the police on the student that night. The student filed a grievance against Amy, but nothing ever became of it. Amy published one paper in 2004, one in 2005, and a last one in 2006. Then she waited until 2009 to publish a paper where she listed her children and husband as co-authors and employees of Cherokee Lab Systems. The address for this lab that conducted the research was the bishop's home address. Amy received repeated warnings that failing to write and publish papers would jeopardize her ability to receive tenure. Tenure is an indefinite appointment, allowing someone to terminate a professor only in extreme circumstances, and the purpose of tenure is to safeguard academic freedom. Professors are hired on for a five-year period and are expected to show good research and service to the university, to apply for grants, and to have published papers to prove that they are a valuable asset to the university. Bishop had published her research plan in 2003, then republished the same plan five years later not having pursued any of those original research goals. In spring 2009, Amy Bishop's application for tenure was denied. The reason cited was that her research and publications were not near the level that they should have been. Her $66,000 per year job was about to evaporate. At least one member of the tenure committee had concerns about Amy's mental health. Amy filed several appeals and even hired a lawyer. One day... Amy went to the university and called the office of the president, David Williams, wanting to discuss her tenure case with him. He refused to meet with her and asked that she not enter the building. Amy saw him leave the building, being escorted out by security. Amy had told her friend, Dr. Deborah Moriarty, they act like I'm going to walk in and shoot somebody. While in Alabama, Amy drifted away from her Massachusetts friends and family. At some point, She stopped returning emails and phone calls. Amy had collaborated with the university on an invention of an automated cell incubator. Her research led to at least one valuable patent, the NQ, a cell incubator that would replace the Petri dish for researchers. The university agreed to give the bishop 70% of the first 50,000 made on the product, then 40% of the profits after that. The university's engineering, biology, and nursing departments worked on the product with Amy and John. The incubator was supposed to work above the ozone layer, so astronauts could work with cell lines in space. A test of the incubator launched on March 7, 2009, and they sent the incubator nearly 20 miles into the sky. When the incubator parachuted back to Earth, they found that many of the cells had died. All three departments continued to work on the incubator, but it came to a standstill. Amy had clarified that she and her husband would be the only people listed on the patent. Individuals who worked on the project would not receive any credit or be listed on any documentation associated with the project. The mechanical engineering students grew tired of the situation and backed out of the project. The cell incubator only came to fruition when a startup company called NQ Bioscience further refined and developed the product. The University of Huntsville technically holds the patent, which lists Amy and James as inventors. 
It has not been disclosed if Amy Bishop has received any royalties from the sale of the incubator. On the afternoon of Friday, February 12, 2010, one of the engineering students was at the university working on a group project with others. He received a call from his advisor telling him to lock the door to the building. It was reported that one of the professors had gone crazy and shot someone on campus. The engineering student said, wouldn't it be weird if it was Dr. Bishop? His random comment was confirmed true within the hour. After her arrest, Amy Bishop was placed on suicide watch in the Madison County Metro Jail in Alabama. The only items inside her cell were a mattress and a Bible. The lights were kept on 24 hours a day. One of the jail employees walked past her cell every 15 minutes to verify that she was alive. Her family was allowed to visit in three weeks. The press hounded James Anderson for information. He said, She's barely holding up. I'm caving in to say the least. Nobody understands what happened. Nobody knows. And I can't sit down and talk to her and ask her about what happened, what went wrong, what broke. James admitted that before the killings, he and Amy had gone to the firing range with a borrowed gun for target practice, so he was not sure where she got the gun. Later on, it surfaced that James had a friend who bought the gun in New Hampshire so he could illegally avoid the waiting period. That gun was a 9mm Ruger, the same kind of gun used in the UAH shooting. When a reporter asked James if there was any correlation between the events in Amy's past and what had happened with the campus shooting, his response was, no, nothing. He thought the stress of the fight for tenure may have been a factor. Judy Bishop had called Amy in jail and had said, it's not your fault. Those people were not nice to you. As Amy sat in a jail cell, her violent past was publicly being revealed. A blogger, Michelle Macklin, had several comments posted to her website from people who had interacted with Amy Bishop. Michelle collected the comments and published them in a post called I Am Dr. Amy Bishop, which detailed all the violent and negative interactions in Amy's past. Students thought Amy was a poor professor and had filed complaints with the UAH administrators, stating that Amy was odd, ineffective, and unsettling in the classroom. Occasionally, Amy would tell students that they were not as bright as their Harvard counterparts. One professor, who wanted to remain anonymous, said he thought she had mental problems within the first five minutes of meeting her. Bishop found out about this remark and filed a complaint. Questions around the death of Amy's brother, Seth, were being raised. For example, Amy had been wearing a coat when she came downstairs with a shotgun because she may have been preparing to flee and the shooting was premeditated. There was a photo of Amy's bedroom from 1986, which showed a National Enquirer magazine laying on her floor. In that magazine was a story about the murder of Patrick Duffy's parents. Patrick had played Bobby Ewing on the TV show Dallas. Two men had killed his parents with a shotgun during an armed robbery, and the men commandeered a vehicle from the dealership to escape. It was almost as if Amy used this story as a template. One shotgun blast could be accidental, but she had fired three rounds. Amy fired the first round into her bedroom, the second round into Seth, and the third round into the kitchen ceiling. After police examined the shotgun, they found a fourth round in the chamber. Amy wrecked the slide after shooting her brother, which means she ejected the shell and put a new round in its place. She also had another round in her jacket pocket. Then, pointing a loaded weapon at individuals and brandishing a gun in front of police officers normally results in felony assault charges being filed. The fact that Amy had demanded a car at gunpoint and refused to drop the gun when ordered to by police was never included in the police report. Amy told law enforcement that her hand was nowhere near the trigger when the bullet was discharged into Seth's chest. The state police ballistics expert stated that the shotgun required five pounds of trigger pressure for it to fire. Amy must have had her finger on the trigger. Police conducted a number of trials with the shotgun and could not produce a single misfire. Amy was sent home with her parents after the initial interview with police. The bishops had 11 days before the police continued their interview with the family. 11 days is a sufficient amount of time to allow them to get their stories aligned. Reporters asked police chief Paul Frazier that given all this information, 
Why was Amy released without charges? He responded that John Polio, who was the police chief during the time of Seth's death, had decided to let Amy go. Reporters then interviewed the 87-year-old retired police chief about the death of Seth Bishop. John Polio was wearing a hat that said, Number One Grandpa, as he gave an interview defending the decisions he made back in 1986. John says that if he had a crystal ball, then he would have done things differently. The district attorney's office reviewed the whole Seth Bishop case file and concluded that there would have been cause to arrest Amy back in 1986. The charges should have been assault with a dangerous weapon, carrying a dangerous weapon, and unlawful possession of ammunition. But the statute of limitations had run out on the charges. On 16 June 2010, the case regarding Seth's death was officially reopened, and Amy was indicted for first-degree murder of her brother, 24 years after his death. Two days later, in an Alabama jail, Amy slit her wrist with a razor blade. She was found by a prison guard with blood pouring out of open wounds in her wrists. She had left a suicide letter that was addressed to her husband. More information about Amy's suicide attempt was not available due to the gag order imposed by the judge, and the Huntsville Hospital would neither confirm nor deny that she had been a patient there. On December 30, 2010, Amy was moved from the medical unit and put into general population for the first time. Amy, who had an IQ of 180, had traded her highly intelligent academic peers for peers that were murderers, rapists, and drug addicts. Ironically, none of them had ever committed a crime as extreme as Amy had. In general population, she immediately got into a fight with another inmate. Amy also had notes, which were confiscated, on how to construct a bomb using paint from the walls on the ceiling and cleaning fluids from the janitors. Later on, she would get into another fight with an inmate in the same cell block. The inmate took a cafeteria tray and beat Amy with it. Bishop fought back with her bare hands. Jail administrators could not release more information on this matter, also due to the gag order. Recovery was a long, hard road for those that survived the shooting. Stephanie Monticello underwent two surgeries one to insert a tracheotomy tube and the other to insert a feeding tube. Later on, medical staff removed her feeding tube and transferred her from ICU into a regular hospital room. She had a dangerous lung infection and had two pulmonary embolisms. She was released to her home, but could not be left alone due to the consequences of her brain injury. Stephanie retired from the university. Besides her injuries, she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Joseph Leahy had critical head wounds and facial fractures. His family set up a blog so they could share Joseph's private life and recovery with the world. Two days after the shooting, they updated the blog to say, Joseph responded to commands. Three days after the shooting, he was unresponsive again. His recovery was proving to be tenuous and unpredictable. But a CT scan of his brain showed swelling, so the fluctuation of his responsiveness was to be expected. After a few weeks, he had reconstructive surgery on his face. Doctors wired his jaw shut and attached a mandible fixator for jaw stabilization. They placed surgical braces to realign his teeth. On March 3rd, he was released from the ICU and transferred to a rehab facility where he had therapy for six hours each day. He also wore a helmet to protect the part of his brain that the bullet had shattered. Joe was released to home on April 14th that year. His family received special training so they could learn how to care for him. In September of that year, Joe had a successful surgery that repaired his right orbital. He also had a plate installed in his skull. A few weeks later, Joseph had a setback when that plate became infected. He had an eighth surgery to install another plate in his skull. Joseph ended up with no sight in his right eye and reduced sight in his left eye. He went back to work and taught classes with the help of an aide. Ironically, Joseph had been a supporter of Amy Bishop. He had liked her and recommended that the university should hire her. Dr. Deborah Moriarty, who had begged for her life during the incident, was made the chair of the biology department. Across the hall from her office was conference room 369R, which remained locked and dark, but was served as a daily reminder of what had taken place. 
After the shooting, there was a drop in enrollment at the college. The Daily Beast listed the university number one on America's 25 most crime-rattled colleges list. Late in 2010, Joseph and Stephanie sued the bishops. The families of Dr. Adriel Johnson and Dr. Maria Raglan Davis filed wrongful death lawsuits against the bishops, the university, and the university's provost, who they contend did not follow safety policy. In addition, they filed another civil action case against the provost and the bishops. It was a 28-page complaint that gave more details in the months leading up to the shooting. Amy did not interact well with students and colleagues. She threatened suicide when she found out that her appeal for tenure was rejected. She was angry, stressed, distracted, and disruptive. She was outspoken and resentful about the vote against her tenure status. She made inappropriate and threatening remarks in staff meetings. She harassed and threatened department members to reconsider their tenure decision. The complaint also said that James Anderson knew of his wife's propensity for violence, and he knew she owned the weapon used to shoot her co-workers. After going through the court system, a judge dismissed the wrongful death lawsuits, stating, There is no evidence before this court to show that anyone could have predicted that Bishop would murder her colleagues on February 12, 2010. The civil lawsuits were settled in 2014, but details were not reported to the public. Roy Miller had 41 years of practice being a lawyer and had worked on 205 jury trials, with 45 of those being homicide cases. Roy was Amy Bishop's court-appointed attorney. He told the media that Amy had severe mental problems. Tenure denial was the catalyst for the incident, and a lesser-known school than Harvard had rejected her. He said that something is wrong with this lady, and her past speaks for itself. In an interview published in The New Yorker, Amy had told him that she was taking the antipsychotic drug Haldol and that she suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. For the University of Alabama Huntsville shooting, the courts charged Amy with one count of capital murder, meaning the murder of two or more individuals, and three counts of attempted murder. On September 22, 2011, law enforcement brought Amy into the courtroom, wearing her red jail jumpsuit with a bulletproof vest, shackles, and handcuffs. Bishop entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. They initially set the trial for March 19, 2012. But that day was postponed a few times due to the testing that needed to be performed on Amy. There were also difficulties finding a fair and unbiased jury. The trial date was reset for September 24, 2012. Roy knew that he could not risk putting her on the witness stand. Amy wanted to die, and she would make sure that happened if they put her on the stand since the prosecution announced that they would seek the death penalty. Roy would need to convince the jury that Amy could not understand the gravity of her actions. The doctors who examined Amy all agreed that there was no doubt something wrong with her, but they couldn't say what it was. She needed further testing to rule out all possibilities until doctors can make a diagnosis. In Alabama, the state does not have to pay for experts for the defense and certainly is not required to pay for experts of the defense's choosing. They denied funds for this additional testing. A licensed clinical and forensic psychologist for the state of Alabama spent time with Amy. This doctor concluded that Amy had a rational understanding of the facts and could understand the nature and wrongfulness of her actions, which would make an insanity defense difficult to prove. In the months leading up to the trial, Amy's defense lawyers would approach the prosecutor, Rob Broussard, from time to time to inquire about a plea deal. He told them no, and he planned to take this case to trial. A few weeks before the trial, a family member of one victim had written Rob a letter. The letter writer stated that some of the families were in favor of dropping the death penalty in exchange for life in prison. Amy had young children, which made some people empathetic. Rob had talked to the other family members and survivors, many of which were ambivalent. They were okay with the situation as long as Amy stayed in prison for the rest of her life. Rob called Bishop's attorneys and offered them the plea deal. Life in prison without the possibility of parole. Amy wanted to go to trial, but her parents and attorneys talked her into taking the deal to avoid the potential of receiving the death penalty. They went to court that same day, Tuesday, September 11, 2012. Amy appeared before the judge and entered her guilty plea. 
which also waived her right to appeal the verdict. The hearing was over quickly, but the attorneys were to remain under gag order. Amy would technically have to have a jury trial, per Alabama law. On Monday, September 24, 2012, people filled into the Madison County Courthouse. Joseph walked in with his wife, Deborah was present, and Dr. Jacqueline Johnson, widow of Adriel, was there with her son. The husband and stepdaughter of Maria were there too. Jury questioning and selection took place. The whole process took little time, unlike normal trial conditions. After opening statements, Deborah was the first witness to take the stand, where she explained the tenure process, spoke a bit about Amy's personality, and recounted the day of the shooting. The second and last witness for the prosecution was Charlie Gray, who was the investigator with the Major Crimes Unit. He confirmed that Larry's pistol and pawn shop have records that showed Amy had been there for target practice seven days prior to the shooting. The defense called no witnesses to the stand, and attorneys gave quick closing arguments. The jury deliberated for only 20 minutes. The foreman of the jury read the verdict, and Amy Bishop Anderson was found guilty of capital murder, as alleged in the indictment. They sentenced Amy to life in prison without parole, as per the plea agreement. Details about restitution to the victims and families of the victims was given as part of the sentencing, but was not revealed in the courtroom. On the next day, Amy left Huntsville for the last time and was taken to the Julia Tutwiler prison, about 200 miles away. She was to spend 30 days in segregation so she could adjust to her new environment. Amy Bishop Anderson's new identity in prison was AIS number 285694, Life Without Parole. The murder trial in Massachusetts for her brother Seth was still not settled. Amy wanted the trial to happen because she wanted to prove her innocence. Her public defender released the following statement, Amy Bishop needs her day in court. Most people would think the dismissing of a murder case is a victory, but when you know you didn't do something, there is a solid reason to say, I want to go through with whatever it takes to get the truth. Amy's parents, Judy and Sam, supported the statement. However, many witnesses were now elderly or dead. Most of the physical evidence was missing, including the murder weapon. Also, the motive was lacking, and having a trial would shine a light on the poor police work done on the 1986 case. On Friday, September 28th, the DA announced that they would not seek extradition, since Massachusetts does not have a death penalty, and in Alabama, Amy was already serving a life sentence. The residents of Alabama thought they heard the last of Amy Bishop, but a few weeks later, in November 2012, she appealed her guilty verdict and claimed that she was pressured into pleading guilty. She withdrew her old attorneys and hired a new one. The district attorney was not surprised that Amy had changed her mind and wanted to appeal because in prison, Harvard-trained Amy Bishop was no longer in the spotlight. Dr. Amy Bishop continues to have her appeals rejected by the court system. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Before I sign off, I would like to make a podcast recommendation. Miss and Alyssa is a documentary-style podcast that takes a fresh look at the unsolved case of Alyssa Turney, who went missing in 2001. There is a link to the podcast in the show notes for this episode, and I hope you check it out. Please visit my website, beyondcontemptpodcast.com, for links to sources and music used in this episode. If you like talking about true crime cases, join the Beyond Contempt Podcast Facebook group. Please support the show by leaving a positive review in Apple Podcasts or share this episode on social media. And thanks for listening. <laughs>